we're off to a great start. Okay. When we were like, you know what? COVID-19, how can we make it better? <laughs> Cannibalism. <laughs> yeah. Just uh, eating other people. <laughs> yeah. Eat the rich, but <laughs> turns out the rich were eating us. Uh, uh, <laughs> yep. Anyway. Yeah. That's fun. Well, welcome that's back to the Minute fun. Women podcast. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> My name is Grace. And I'm Linnea. <laughs> this is our first cold open, I think. I think so. <laughs> we'll see how much of that mark keeps. And we'll, uh, <laughs> yeah. that might be for bonus content later. Bonus content later. <laughs> uh, well, you know, they should have a cannibalistic heritage. <laughs> Really? Someday. I'm sure there were cannibals in Canada. Oh, for sure. Yeah. It's too cold for there not to be <laughs> cannibalism. Did you know that there's a word in Russian? I forget what it is exactly, but it's specifically, it translates to man cow, and it would be used in the gulags for a person that you would fatten up with the purpose <laughs> of escaping with them into the tundra, and then you would eat them. <laughs> Oh word God. for it that that person either is like really naive and doesn't yeah. understand or is like hoping that because you've beefed them up so much that yeah. they can like beat you in a fight <laughs> yeah that's true and that just reminds me of um in game of thrones what's that guy's name the sweet fat boy who oh. was Jon Snow's friend? Oh, 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 Sam. Sam. <laughs> <laughs> Sam is the you're the man cow. <laughs> That's the why Jon Snow kind of kept like him around. <laughs> Jon Snow was like, I'm gonna need you, Sam. Sam, oh like, someday yeah. I will get lost in the tundra. And, and I will I'll need, need you, Sam. I will need you, Sam. <laughs> Sam doesn't know why. Sam's like, all oh, right, all right. <laughs> I can read books. <laughs> Yeah, Sam, that's why I bring you to read books. To read books. <laughs> Rewatch Game of Thrones. And every time they talk about a book or reading book, just imagine that it's code for eating Sam. <laughs> oh, that's funny. I love that. Okay, this is also our first episode back after uh, Joe Biden is officially in office in oh, the yeah. United States. Yeah. And uh, he made it. It only <laughs> took one day for America to be semi under control and not have a lunatic running the country for our governor general to resign here and shit to go down Bad. the tubes in Canada. Yeah, we're on like a four year leg. So I predict yeah. for the next four years, it'll be just trash garbage it's here. It's going to be a trash garbage. <laughs> um, just like, can we, can we focus on Alberta? Can we just look at how yeah. messed up life is over? there can <sighs> also quick note about the governor general yeah so i met her mm. um when i was sailing on the balloon she came aboard What's the tea yeah so she came aboard was she a total bitch to you? yes oh! to everyone burr, 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 burr. to everyone so she so she like kind of made a deal about how she didn't want to go on a public sale or anything and that's fine. That's fine. Whatever. So we okay. had to like schedule another sale for also, like. you're not that famous. Right. For her and her people. <laughs> and she came on and she was just. And I didn't think anything of it then. But my mom reminded me. My mom was like, yeah, when she came on the Blue Nose, like you said that she was just like kind of bitchy. And I was like, you're so right. Like she was. She was just kind of like, this is what I want you to do. Like, hey, captain of the Blue Nose. I want you to take the boat here and then I want you to like put up the sails here and then I want you to like do this and then I want to be back by this time like okay, thank you Weird. and it was just like yeah she like had her little crew of merry men and women with her <laughs> um yeah and she just like basically talked about space the whole time because she was an astronaut and like told and us all how to she was an astronaut of. yeah it's so. it, it is one of those things where it's like not to take away from her accomplishments, because she's clearly a very accomplished person. Yeah. But it just takes a certain personality to survive in politics. Oh, 100%. And if you're a woman, you're under way more scrutiny. Oh, 100%. There's definitely some of that at play. But 100%. if you're not a nice person, and you're a female in a very public honorary office... Yeah. It well, is so hard to thing. survive. That's the thing. And she also kind of, like, bypassed the policies. Usually, like... The prime minister mm -hmm. finds someone he wants as governor general, and then he like brings it up to the queen, and then it's selected. Yeah, she bypassed that. She went. She went to the queen and was like, "Hey, I think I'd make a really good governor general for Canada." And the <laughs> right, and the queen was like, <sighs> "The queen was, oh, I'm just just drinking some tea, but okay, 
okay, I've got to go with the dogs, but okay, you be governor general. It's like, I don't really care. <laughs> sure. I, we still control parts of Canada. <laughs> oh. Okay, goodbye now, love. Bye. Yeah. <laughs> Um, so yeah, she kind of bypassed that. So there's Weird. definitely going to be a much more strict policy of how that's selected. But yeah, yeah, it's just so bizarre. Like I just <laughs> wasn't something I was expecting. Yeah. And it's also a, like, it's such a Canadian scandal. I know. Of like nothing really, really bad happened. She was just really mean to yeah, people. It was like 26 people and or that's something. Enough. Yeah. 26 people or something were like interviewed of her staff. Yeah. And it was like. They none of them would release their names because of fear of like getting in trouble from her. And but it was like many of them cried in their cars after their work day. <laughs> like this is so Canadian. <laughs> like, but like I love that that's enough. Like yeah. that's enough. You're in a place of power, yeah. and you're you're abusing it to just enough to like just ruin your co- your like employees' days, yeah. day in day out. You yeah. don't deserve to be our governor general. No, lady. <laughs> um, okay, so. Uh, I'm assuming we're not talking about governor generals or cannibalism today. No, but we are talking about politics. <gasps> I'm so, excited. Uh, there's a little bit of wiggle room it? there. Hit me with it. Um, we're going to do the Hart and Papineau Heritage Minute. Okay. Um, but we're really just going to talk about Louis-Joseph Papineau. Great. Um, do you remember that Heritage Minute? Yeah. I like Papineau. Papineau. It's just the, it's the, for people who don't remember, it's the one where they're just like, yeah, Jewish people should have full rights. Yeah. But that, to say that that's what Louis Papineau is known for is stupid. Okay. <laughs> like, that is, like, not even an end note in what he did. Okay. He's more, he's one of the leaders that brings lower Canada, which is now Quebec, into the rebellions of 1837 to 38. Okay. Which is ultimately what results in the uni- unification of upper and lower Canada and the arrival of responsible government, which meant that colonies could basically have the rights of democracy and like independence see why don't they say that stuff in the heritage minute i don't know because jewish people is more important i guess and i guess that's like (laughs) it's an uncomplicated thing that's nice so you like hart and papineau and together like hart is that we all agree with yeah and and papineau he's very as we'll go through he's very anti-clerical he doesn't align very much with the Catholic faith or Christianity and he doesn't think that it has any place in government so the fact that you have to swear on the Bible and Hart arrives and tries to swear and doesn't want to swear on the Bible because right, he's Jewish, he's Jewish that's something that Papineau is opposed to so you know is he a huge proponent of anti-Semitism no but no. this kind of like falls in line with his wider philosophies but he's like oh yeah that makes sense yeah and that is like it's such a small thing in Papineau's career. So we're going to try and like work through his career. I will say political history, not my strong suit. So especially the colonial history of Canada, because it is something that we do not talk about no. ever. No. If it happened before world war one, Canadian history doesn't care. Yeah. A lot of the time. That's super true. Yeah. People know Canadian Pacific railway. Yeah. And like, that's about it. Yeah. <laughs> before. That's pretty much it. Yeah. Some people were born. That are important. Yeah. But they didn't really do their important Canadian things until <laughs> afterwards. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Because I think we've all bought into the idea that there is no Canadian nation until after World War One. Yeah. And to some extent, that's like our modern idea of nationalism. But you can see it here, like in this yeah. story, people have a really fierce desire for independence from Britain during this period of time. Right. And it's really led by Lower Canada because they're French and yeah. they don't want to be connected to the British crown. They're tired so. of the monarch. They're just t- They're over it. I'm just so tired. Yeah. <laughs> so we're going to talk about LJP, Louis-Joseph Papineau. I love it. <laughs> Who was born on October 7th, 1786. Nice. Great year. Yeah. For some. <laughs> for him especially. Not for others. <laughs> um, two generations prior, the Papineau name meant very little in Quebec society. His grandfather was merely a farmer and a cooper, but the Papineau family was greatly advantaged by the more accessible upward mobility that the colonies offered. Do you know what a cooper is? So a cooper, I believe, it, it is like um, like a uh, someone who makes barrels. Oh, yeah. okay, cool. So it, I, I'm not sure what part of the barrel making process, like if they make the rings or if they like 
okay, do whatever. Cool. But yeah, they make their own. Cool, cool. That. Koopa. Oh my gosh, mind blown. That makes so much sense. Why? Because there's a Cooper's Inn in Shelburne. Okay. And Shelburne is super famous for their barrel making that they do on the waterfront. <laughs> right across from Cooper's <laughs> Inn. It's all come full circle. Full barrel, if you will. I would like to say that today's episode is already a success. Okay. Because we've already learned so much. So much. Cannibalism. Okay. Barrels. Yeah. <laughs> Don't be mean. <laughs> don't the be mean. General. If you're the GG, don't be mean. <laughs> okay. Uh, Louis's father, Joseph Papineau, uh, managed to become a surveyor and a notary who on occasion constructed mills and managed seigneuries, so obviously moving up very quickly in society. And eventually he became a politician and acquired his own seigneury. So those are like estates or, or, or cool. fiefs in the British system. Growing up, Papineau's family was not much different from most peasant families, but they did instill a very bourgeoisie sense of family values. So even though they're not really bourgeoisie, they're already ready to be like family loyalty. Right. Be loyal to the family. This was also... Or you die. (laughs) Or you die. (laughs) The family has prestige. Yeah. They want it to have prestige. Yeah. And the extended family, like cousins and uncles... Is just abound with rivalries. Like, everybody oh. bickers. So okay. the nuclear family is really gelled quite close together by this. Okay. And so for Papineau's whole life, he's really affected by this, and he shows uncompromising loyalty to his family and tradition. For him, the family environment was one of affection and security and a refuge from a very hostile society. Okay. So as he goes in, you'll he'll often make the statement that he just wants to, like, go into the country, read his books, and be with his family. That sounds nice. It's also a huge lie, though, because he, oh. like, the second he goes and does that, he's like, God, I'm bored. <laughs> I want to just go back. That's fun. Papineau was very close to his mother and his father. In letters from his mother, she appears to have been a very strong-willed, cold, at least outwardly, uh, authoritarian, and unswervingly devout person. Okay. So she's super religious and just a cold, hard bitch. Okay. <laughs> Louis Joseph's mother um, saw him as his as her favorite, so he's like the perfect favorite child. Okay, <laughs> <laughs> and much like his mother, Papineau would grow up to be quite austere and skeptical. His father, on the other hand, was a meticulous man, inclined to be quite gruff and uncommunicative, and seems to have shown more benevolence and indulgence in his dealings with his children. So he's like the softy. Okay. The kids. He's a good cop. He's the good cop. <laughs> Especially Louis Joseph. So yeah. again, he's like they're they're his parents' favorite. Elgie's perfect. <laughs> Unlike his mother, his father did not possess a very uh, strong religious feeling. So he renounced Catholicism probably around the eighteen oh, tens. He's I, like straight up like, I don't believe any of this garbage. Yeah. And his mom is just like, he gets. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, and he did not return uh, to the Catholic faith until shortly before his death, which is my favorite part of Catholicism, yep. is that it doesn't matter what you do. If you are on your deathbed and you're like, I believe in God, please forgive my sins, you're good. Yeah. That's it. Yeah, that's all you got to do. <laughs> it's such a write-off. <laughs> yep. Um, these opposing views of religion would also impact Papineau for his whole life. So he has a very... Uh, interesting relationship with religion, as we kind of talked about earlier. He doesn't believe that it should be the government and stuff. Right. As a young adult, Papineau entered the College of St. Raphael in Montreal, which was directed by the Sulpicians, who are a religious order. Okay. Um, So it's a very religious, strict education. Welcome to Montreal in the 1700s. 1802. Oh, 1802 now. Brand new century. Still. (laughs) Yeah. However, following an incident that I could not find anything about, I don't, I don't know what happened, he got in trouble with authorities, and he got kicked out of school. Oh, God. So something happened, and I don't know what. Maybe he kissed a boy. <laughs> <laughs> That'll do it. I don't know. The 1800s were pretty, like, gay. <laughs> but, they were, but they're like, it's not gay. It's, it's brotherly affection. <laughs> like, I'm not kissing my brother, Okay. There's so much stuff that happens in the past where they're just like, there is nothing more manly than loving your friends. <laughs> and just through gritted teeth and like pent up homosexuality. <laughs> <laughs> oh, 
gritted teeth and pent up homosexuality. Yeah. <laughs> and if just to make sure that he wasn't gay, though, yeah. his parents sent him to the seminary. Oh, well. So he's like, now you're going to be a priest. <laughs> yeah. And he's just like, oh, no. <laughs> I'm not suggesting that he was gay. I don't I think was he was say, actually gay. There's no, there's no gays, Catholic priests out there. <laughs> wink, wink, nudge, <laughs> not nudge. One. <laughs> I'm really sorry, Catherine Arsenault, <laughs> that you have to listen to this episode. No, that's okay. Their best friend is a gay ex-priest. Oh, right, <laughs> right. Yeah, <laughs> they're they're aware. They know. Okay, <laughs> they're cool. They're cool. Parents. They're cool. So this education was very traditional. Courses are taught in Latin. It's the Ugh. primary language of the school. Uh, content was taught basically ignoring everything that had happened in the previous century. So in the previous century, you have the French Revolution, and none of that will be taught. That nice. did not happen. Okay. <laughs> there is no such thing as democracy <sighs> or, you know, class struggle. Like, that's that's not real. The only thing that is real is this cult of authority and <laughs> obedience sustained by an aristocratic and hierarchical vision of society. Okay. So there is a God-sent reason that we have the upper class, and they are there to protect the lower classes. Yeah. Which is... Okay. So true. <laughs> well. <laughs> Don't we all agree? <laughs> They imposed on their pupils the theory of divine right of absolute monarchy. So there's a reason the queen is the queen, and there's a reason the king is the king. Whatever. At the seminary, Papineau had a reputation for being a very gifted pupil, uh, but not much of a worker. And, but he was a great reader. Okay. So he reads good, but he's not very interested in doing no his work homework. Ethic. He also later reflected that while he was at the seminary, this was when he lost his Catholic faith. <laughs> Nothing like the seminary to make you not believe in Catholicism. <laughs> I feel like I feel like you either go one way or the other yeah. at the seminary. You're either like, yeah, ooh, I love being Catholic, <laughs> fuck yeah, Catholicism, fuck yeah. <laughs> or you're just like, what the fuck? This is weird. Yeah, <laughs> I'm just gonna, I'm just gonna go. Yeah. It's trial by fire, trial yeah. by burning bush. <laughs> yeah. Despite the somewhat intellectually oppressive environment, <laughs> uh, he did value his time at the seminary Good. greatly. Uh, he later reflected, quote, never have I felt more than I do now what I owe to the seminary. Okay. So I think in some ways, you know, it's shitty, but it sent him on a path yeah. that he otherwise would not have taken. Okay. So he leaves the seminary in 1804. So he's not going to become a priest. Okay. He's like, peace out. Yeah. <laughs> uh, Papineau then really hesitated as to what career he would try to pursue in that respect he was like many graduates of his time who were very ill prepared by the environment and by their education to adapt themselves to social change oh, wow weird, weird. Um, I'm, I'm gonna say this now papano is the original millennial i was gonna say this this <laughs> issue still exists it's like i went through this schooling and i'm not prepared <laughs> for life outside this school yeah, and then you're like, oh, university, and then you're like, okay, wasn't prepared for this, but they're gonna prepare me for the real world, and then you graduate university, and you're like, oh, how do I do my taxes? Yeah, <laughs> is this taxable? Yeah. <laughs> uh, can someone please tell me how to properly get insurance for my vehicle? Because yeah. I don't know. I have this like, I have savings. <laughs> I don't know what to do with them. I just have them in a jar labeled yeah. beer money, <laughs> and I don't know what to do. So his choices were pretty limited in a lot of ways yeah. as to what. He, so once once he rejects the priesthood, the only thing that is available are the liberal professions. So that's like law or being a clerk, an accountant. Right. Um, he first decided that he was going to become a notary like his father, but then he later opted for the profession of lawyer. He received his legal training at Montreal in the office of his cousin complaining that all of his time studying was depriving him of free time to read his favorite books. <laughs> so he loves to read, like, Voltaire, Diderot, oh, yeah. like, these revolutionary philosophical thinkers. And he's like, God, but I have to read common law. <laughs> I hate this. Property taxes. Ugh. Ugh. Once he was authorized to practice law in 1810, he began working intermittently, but continued to make his dissatisfaction heard. Nice. It's like, I'm like a part-time lawyer. I'm but like I'm a, really an entrepreneur. I'm a cool lawyer. I'm like a cool lawyer. Oh. I only do enough lawyer to, like, be, like fund my trips to Europe. He's like, he's like those girls now that get, like, university educations and then are like... 
I was so tired and I was so bored and I didn't have free time and now I sell this product and I make a living and, and I, I don't leggings on need Instagram. to teach. <laughs> He's like, I don't need to law because I'm a revolutionary. <laughs> I just see him as those like fuck boys who are like, I'm an entrepreneur. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Would you like to give me five hundred dollars, Kelly, when I start up? <laughs> Yeah, on the side, I'm a barista. <laughs> but I'm only a barista long enough until that, like, my career finally takes off. Are you sure his name's We're not, not talking about Mark. I was just going to say, are you sure his name's not Mark Boudreaux? <laughs> are you sure We're not Pepino? talking about you, Mark? I swear. You don't talk like that. No. You've never asked me for money, except for rent for the studio. But that's different. But that's different. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> that's infrastructure costs. <laughs> um, in 1816, Papineau wrote his brother... Oh, in which he said, in truth, I am very much a slave at this moment, and that does not endear me over much to a condition with which I was disgusted. But what is to be done? What is to be done? Yeah, you're a real slave, Papineau. <laughs> a little paps. While there's literal <laughs> slavery happening. Yeah. <laughs> in, in around where you Your are. Your life is so hard. Your life is really hard. Oh, my God. <laughs> It was in this period that he began to celebrate the nameless hopes and joys of rustic life. So this is the <laughs> other part of him, is he constantly wants to escape to the country. He is a millennial! Oh, no. <laughs> in 1808... So like, I just want to grow a beard and live <laughs> off the land. And I just, like, it's a shame that, like, it's longboarding wasn't existed. Because he <laughs> would be longboarding. Oh, my <laughs> God. Louis Papineau longboarding <laughs> through the streets of Montreal. Yeah. <laughs> and his, like, and his, like, 1800s lawyer coat. Like, <laughs> tails <The> tail. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So, in 1808, he was elected to the assembly for the county of Kent. And this began his very long political career oh. um, that did not come to an end until the 1850s. Wow. So throughout his time, he serves and represents the counties of Montreal West, Surrey, Montreal, St. Maurice, and Deux Montagnes. Deux Montagnes. Deux Montagnes. Okay. <laughs> Sometimes French sounds nice. It does. I love that. Like, I love that twang. But twang. That, yeah. that we don't really have in English here, at least. It's I feel like, now I wonder if that's where, like, twang comes from in the South. Because they have a lot of French oh, overholds. Yeah. It's true. Yeah. Well, I also think about it. It's, like, words that when you say them in a slangy way. Like, if we'd go, like, like, there's yes, but then we'd say, like, yep. It's, yep. like, in French, like, you're, like, wah. Like, wah. Wah. Like, <laughs> it's, like, yeah, you're just answering. You're, you're like, well, you know, like, it's like, wah. <laughs> no. <laughs> no. Especially in Quebec. Yeah. Quebec has, like, this great accent. Yeah. That's so butchery. <laughs> almost, like, it's funny because it's obviously where you would become most proficient in French in Canada. Uh -huh. Like, that is where you would probably go if you want to learn French. Yeah. But I know that, like, francophone speaker or french speakers in france see that accent as basically the way we would see like a hillbilly accent yeah <laughs> they're like oh god <laughs> they're like oh it's our cousins from across <laughs> the pond <laughs> so no doubt politics allowed him to express certain aspects of his personality uh but they left him unsatisfied eager for the day when he could live in the country with his family and have his books all around him um, like a true millennial, when he did eventually find time to enjoy this lifestyle when he became the senior of Montebello, okay. he proved to be just as unhappy as he was during his law and political career. So Papineau is just eternally unhappy. <laughs> He's yeah. always, like, wanting something more. I'm doom and gloomer. But it's, <laughs> yeah, it's, like, really hard to pinpoint what he wants yeah. exactly. Bet he wears a lot of black. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe, I don't know. <laughs> so... We're getting a little bit ahead of ourselves. He's oh. not the senior yet. Okay. He will hold all these offices, but we're just at the beginning of his political career. Okay. Um, in, 19, in 1809, when he was elected to the Assembly of Lower Canada, it was at the height of a political crisis that started in 1805. So he's arriving in the midst of some, some turmoil taking place. Right. This crisis, which was unquestionably new, had been marked by the emergence of French-Canadian nationalism and political parties. The economic, demographic, and social changes of the first decade of the 19th century were felt as a mortal threat by the elements which were becoming un 
becoming conscious of the existence of a Canadian nation. So they're trying to find themselves. Sort of. <laughs> it's like, who are we? What do we want to be? Is it Canada always trying to find <laughs> ourselves? <laughs> and it's also the issues of their economic situations. It's like, this is not being addressed in Britain. Right. So how, what, are we, what are we supposed to do? How do we how to help? Yeah. And you also have a growing middle class that's becoming educated and entering the political forum. And now, so you have to answer to these people who are like, I don't own swaths of land. Like, Like, yeah, old money is becoming less relevant at that point. Exactly. New money is a thing. Yeah. So the liberal professions, in association with small merchants, devoted themselves at the time to the defense of the traditional French-Canadian institutions and opposed the English merchants, the public servants, the American immigrants, and the so-called French-Canadian traders. <laughs> <laughs> okay. <laughs> On the 29th of April, 1818, Papineau got married. He oh. marries a girl named uh, Julie Bruno. And she was the daughter of a wealthy merchant. And as we kind of talked about his, not that his home life is ever bad. I think they have a fairly good relationship, okay. but he's always like out of the house. And when right. he is finally in the house, he's just like, God, I don't want to be here. Yeah. <laughs> Against the advice of his father, Papineau joined the Parti Canadien, which is the reformer party. So these okay. are like the leftists. They have ideas. They have <laughs> thoughts. <Yeah. laughs> it's wild. He's kind of considered a moderate in the party. So he's not like, revolution. Yeah. But he's like, we do need different things. Yes. <laughs> he's like, changes could be made. We have <laughs> notes. <laughs> yeah. um, and because he is a bit more moderate, they feel more comfortable having him elected Speaker of the House of Assembly in 1815. Right, because he's not going to be like, let's riot. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Despite the rivalries of all kinds which plagued the Parti Canadien, his authority continued to grow with the ever-increasing concentration of problems in the Montreal region. He earned some stripes when he went to London to oppose the 1822 Union of the St. Lawrence River Valley. So there was essentially the idea that we should unify everything that's in the St. Lawrence River Basin, so that would cut into Upper Canada. Oh, yeah. But essentially, that would be all of the powerful economic centers, and it would be dominated by, like, an English assembly. Right. And they were like, no, thank you. Yeah. Please. In 1826, the Parti Canadien became the Patriot Party, or Patriot Party. Papineau's authority, despite the rivalries that continued in the party, increased as the party's objectives became more extreme. So okay. now we're kind of getting to, we're building to the revolutions and, or the, the rebellions, I should say. And their concern, his concern is like, oh, there's gonna, this is gonna be like violent. Yeah. <laughs> this isn't good. But he still manages to stay quite afloat. Okay. Even though more and more people are like, you're, you're gonna betray us. Like, <laughs> Judas. No. Judas. No. <laughs> not me. Not me. I like, to, JP? I, I like to read. <laughs> I just want to read my books in the country. Oh, wait. No, wait. Yeah. <laughs> the party brought together, quote, the most diverse elements, the French-Canadian middle bourgeoisie, a few English liberals, the Irish. <laughs> the Irish are like, hell yeah, burn it to the ground. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Uh, uh, <laughs> farmers of American origin who had settled in the eastern townships. So it was like the English-speaking part of Quebec. Right. And the French-Canadian peasant classes. So it's a very diverse group of people that are yeah. part of the Patriot Party. The farmers are like, we don't know no French, but uh, <laughs> if you want to help us out, <laughs> I'll give you my firstborn. I don't want to pay rent. Yeah. Uh, so that'd be great. Yeah. <laughs> Defections were severely punished. So if you betray the party in any way, they're just scathing. Okay. There, there's... Loyalty is is in high demand. Like, are we talking whippings in the middle of the town square or nothing physical? Oh, but I, I think it's like the end of your political career. Oh right, if you're gonna go, they just the make party. you wear a dunce cap and walk around town. <laughs> yeah, and, and this is kind of before the idea that we've all kind of been indoctrinated into that you have to vote with your party. Right, like that's not really a thing yet. You can still no. go outside of your party, but yeah. we're coming into the era where you're expected not to. Right. Um, so party allegiance is becoming a thing, and Papineau's not really for it. He's not here for it. Shockingly, he thinks that you should just vote with your morals and your ethics. Yep. 
there are also big rivalries that are within the party. Um, in connection to this, Thomas Frederick Elliott wrote in 1835, quote, I have never seen anyone who appeared more skilled than this Canadian speaker, referring to Papineau, uh-huh. um, in the contrivance and compartment, comportment by means of which a single man dominates the minds of a large number, and he becomes more rooted every day in his authority as they in their obedience. Such is the man whom a small number of his supporters have the presumption to believe that they can discard when he is no longer useful to them. One look from Papineau would subdue all his Canadian flock. So he's just like, yeah, he's the shepherd. He's like, the shepherd. Yeah, so this is kind of the height of his power is like nice. in the like le- leading into this era. The Patriots wanted revolution. That's yep. what they are seeking. Yep. They wanted independence from the British Empire. They wanted social transformation. They wanted economic liberation. Papineau in a letter stated, People have reconcurred their natural independence by having recourse to arms, and they are by letting the earth drink the blood of their oppressors. To stir up peoples, one must not rest content with debating purely abstract questions. Something more solid is required. One must touch the sentimental part, the purse. (laughs) It's like, you want to get people riled up? Talk about the money. Give us your money. Um, He continues, so as long as a question of this nature is not raised, agitation cannot be constant and lasting. In the circumstances, I see no question more calculated to lead to this end than the abolition of seigneurial rights. So these are like the landlords. The government, the seigneurs, and the haute petite aristocrats of both parties will no doubt oppose this, but the masses will unite and act in concert. Nice. So he's calling for, like, class revolution. Like he's, like, that. a cool guy. When he he's is a cool guy. He does have good ideas when he's not being, like... Whiny. Whiny as hell. Yeah. <laughs> I think all revolutionaries are a little whiny, especially yeah. ones that come from some money. Like, he's yeah. not coming from money. But he comes from, like, a decent place. Yeah. And I think it's one of those things where you have the ability to fight for class rights, which is good. But also, like, I don't think you'd really relate to a lot of lower class people. It's like like people in middle class still today. It's like you just kind of have the, like, I don't want to go for my education that I'm able to, like, do. When yeah, I'm like, tired today. I come from such a place yeah. of privilege, <laughs> and it's important for me to yeah. announce that to everyone that yeah. I am white and I yeah. am beautiful and I come from money. <laughs> <laughs> it's like okay. It's like all right, Grace. <laughs> Towards uh, 1830, Papineau stepped up his virulent attacks on non-elective legislative council and declared himself a Republican. Oh. He became an advocate for independence of Lower Canada and became increasingly critical of imperial authority. Um, as a footnote, in 1831, he, support, he sponsored a law which granted full equivalent political rights to Jews. Okay. <laughs> that's what the heritage minute is about. But like yeah. we've gone through so much we've and gone they're through like so much. that's what we're gonna make the heritage minute about. <laughs> I also wanna say I feel like especially after the last freaking four years, Republican has become such a bad word. And I don't think that the Republican Party is a bad party. No. I, I, I like Donald Trump was a bad guy. But yeah. I don't but I think that it's definitely given like, I think the word Republican is now, like, a dirty, dirty word. Yeah, that's not what it means. No. Yeah, Republican is, like, a philosophy. Yeah. And that you support a republic yeah. rather than a monarch or a whatever. Right? Like, and, yeah. like, Donald Trump was a very piss-poor example of any type of political leader. Yeah. Um. Like, I do, yeah, I just think people now associate Republican with being, like, bad and mm-hmm. being, like, Donald Trump. And that's not necessarily what it means. And in a lot of cases, the Republican Party in the United States does not support things that are very Republican. Yeah. Like being a Republican implies a certain faith in the state. And yeah. in a lot of cases, the Republican Party is very anti-state. It's yeah. very well, it's pro-states, but yeah. it's very anti-government. It's yeah. you should have more control over your own personal finances. And like yeah. if you are a right leaning uh fiscally conservative person yeah like that's going to be the party you vote for yeah. i don't personally subscribe to that no. but like no nor do i yeah just uh yeah, yeah. i just, like hearing that he's a republican i feel like 
Especially, this is the roots of that. Yeah, yeah. Like that doesn't mean that he's Donald Trump. Yeah. So was <laughs> so was Abraham Lincoln. Yeah. Abraham Lincoln was a Republican. Yeah. Like <laughs> it's not until really it's really not until the Democratic Party had financial and political gain in supporting yeah. more leftist ideas, even though I would not consider them leftist no. in general. Um that the the tables kind of turn and yeah. you have Republicans on the right and Democrats on the left. Yeah. It's Democratic parties that are like Jim Crow and stuff in the South. Yeah. So it all yeah. means nothing. nothing. They don't care about you. <laughs> <laughs> um, but yeah, so he supports this bill that would give Jewish people equivalent political rights. This is 27 years before it happened anywhere else in the British Empire. Oh, that's cool. Yeah, so it is quite early. Yeah. The events that led to Jewish people receiving full citizenship rights in Lower Canada in advance of other nations or territories was due to the involvement of one Ezekiel Hart. So that is the other person in the Heritage Minute who yeah. I didn't go into quite so much. He doesn't have quite as prolific uh, a political career, but he was a Jewish person who had proved his dedication to the burgeoning Canadian identity by raising money to support troops in lower Canada to help in defense against the United States uh, invading from the south right and so this would come after the war of 1812 and that was kind of more uh, a more imminent a threat. Worry. Yeah. yeah so I, I think Papineau definitely saw like this person has a lot of character and clearly is in support of our beliefs and because of his religion we're not gonna let him have full rights oh, that's, that's ridiculous. stupid yeah yeah after a sweeping electoral victory in 1834, Papineau increased his efforts to paralyze the political system. Goaded by revolutionary elements of his party, he intensified his policy of boycott and political obstruction in order to force the British government to grant reforms intended to transfer power to representatives of a French-Canadian nation. So he's just like boycotting, which yeah. is what we do today. Yeah. <laughs> it's just like, don't pass anything. Total political shutdown until yeah. we get what we want. Probably the defining moment of Papineau's career came that same year when he drafted with w other members of the Parti Patriot uh, not the 92 Resolutions. So okay. the 92 Resolutions was a long series of demands for political reforms. 92, I'm assuming. <laughs> 92 reforms. <laughs> yeah. That is a long list. Yep. <laughs> it, it calls for political reforms in British the British-governed colony. Papineau presented the 92 Resolutions to the Legislative Assembly... Uh, they were approved and they were sent to London. The resolution included, among other things, demands for an elected legislative council and an executive council responsible before the House of Representatives. Under the Constitutional Act of 1791, the government of Lower Canada was given an elected legislative assembly, but members of the upper houses were appointed by the governor of the colony. So it's kind of like how our Senate is appointed, yeah. but the Senate doesn't really have very much power anymore. Yeah. During this time, the executive council would have a lot of power, and okay. the upper house would have a lot of power. So... The fact that they're appointed is just like constant gridlock between right. elected representatives and appointed representatives. In the resolution, the elected representatives once again reiterated their loyalty to the British crown, but expressed frustration that the government in London had been unwilling to correct the injustices caused by past governments of the colony. Papineau's resolutions were ignored for almost three years. Meanwhile, the Legislative Assembly did all it could to oppose the unelected upper houses while avoiding outright rebellion. British Colonial Secretary Lord Russell eventually responded to the 92 resolutions with his own 10 resolutions, oh. which are now called the Russell Resolutions. Okay. All of the Legislative Assembly's demands were rejected. <laughs> oh. It's just like, my answer is... No. no. <laughs> his, his 10 resolutions, no. <laughs> no. <laughs> no. Uh-uh. <laughs> nope. <laughs> they just get to five and they're just like one of those little fancy brackets and they're just like, no. <laughs> five through <laughs> ten. Yeah. Uh -uh. <laughs> uh -uh. <laughs> Not going to happen. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> so these resolutions reached Canada in 1837. Okay. And many of Papineau's reformists began to agitate for rebellion. So if... If you know anything about Canadian history, 1837 and 1838, important years. Important years. They have rebellions named after them. Yep. And this is kind of the spark that ignites those things. Yep. It's just, it is mind-blowing to me that we don't know that stuff. I picture, like, Papineau just, like, sitting on a desk with his feet up, <laughs> smoking a pipe, and then someone's like, we're gonna have a rebellion. And he's just like, um... Sounds like a lot of work. I just... <laughs> 
not really feeling that today. Yeah. We could write more lists. I like lists. I like lists. <laughs> I'm very organized. We can I put Rebellion like on the list. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. It'll be like in the 80s, I think. Like 86. They're there, like with their, they're, they're there with their like rifles. and <laughs> It's like, we're ready to go. He's, He's like, like, ooh, I forgot my pitchfork, actually. <laughs> Can we just like hold off till Tuesday? <laughs> <laughs> the Tuesday Rebellions. That sounds so good. It does. It does. <laughs> uh, um, yeah. It's just like events like this. I do. Not that I think that American history is done better than Canadian history. Uh, there are different styles. Yeah. But I do think, like, that's important. Why don't we know that? We have convinced ourselves that Canada was a nation built on peace yeah. and democracy and conversation, and it's not true. America is definitely a country that takes pride in their building of a, of yeah. a country. Yeah, and like, Canada, not so much. And it's... Like yeah. people like George Washington, yeah. like Benjamin Franklin, like they're so revered. And well, someone and like we, Papineau, who admittedly participates in very similar revolutionary activities, yeah. I think most people don't even know who he is. I could probably, like, before we started this episode, like at this point, like if you would have come in and been like, literally read a thousand words on Benjamin <laughs> Franklin, I could have done it. If yeah. you would have been like read a thousand words on Papineau, I would have been like... He's in a heritage minute. <laughs> He's French. He loved Jewish people. His last name's Papineau. <laughs> Which is a great last Papineau's name. Papineau's very French. We haven't acknowledged that yet. Yeah. Papineau. It's a great last name. Great last name. Um, but yeah, like it is, it's true. I'm an American. I mean, American culture is just so, like it's so, it's movies and television and books. Yeah. And we just see it so often in Canada. Yeah, that yeah. That it's, Yeah. And it's even going through this. I was like, I don't know any of this. Yeah. Like, I don't, I never learned any of this in the two history degrees I have. Yeah. Like, we choose not to look at this. And I'm not saying that that is inherently wrong. I You're think such that, a critical thinker. <sighs> You're ready for the real world. I'm just so critical. <laughs> Why can't you just be happy? <laughs> <laughs> because I'm a critical thinker. <laughs> Um, but yeah, it's just like I, I, we choose to look at different parts of our, our nation's history and that's that's fine. That's whatever. Mm. But I think that something like this is is a very pivotal moment in Canadian yeah. history. And it, yeah, it's it's the reason that Canadian colonies are the first British colonies to have responsible government. Like Nova yep. Scotia, first province to have responsible government. Like, yeah, we were. Yeah, we were first. We were number one. <laughs> Even though they did all the work, to be yeah. honest. To be frank, yeah. uh, they did all the work in Upper Lower Canada. We, <laughs> our bill passes first. Yeah, Nova so Scotia we get responsible was like, government. okay, we're in. Let's do it. It's like, yeah, I, I, I'd like to have a say. <laughs> <laughs> Um, so yeah, so when the demands were categorically rejected in Britain for all these the 92 resolutions, um, there was a very deep popular feeling inflamed by social and economic crisis that started to occur, and, and Papineau began to lose control of the events that happened, but he set in motion. So right. he sets all of this in motion, but as you, we've kind of referred to a couple times, while he is very revolutionary, he doesn't want violence. He doesn't want rebellion. He wants to do this the quote unquote right way. Oh, um, the right way, eh? The, the okay, right way. Okay, Papano. Um, so when people are becoming more inclined to rebellion, he kind of starts losing sway with them. Oh. During the months of April and May 1837, the Patriots put their strategy into motion, and it doesn't seem like they were unanimous in a lot of their decisions. Right. This is when you start to see, like, factions of the party come out. Okay. The radical wing certainly opted for openly revolutionary steps. On Papineau's side, representing a more prudent and moderate elements of the party, uh, it appears they have favored something that is a little more complicated in the tactics. So it's, it's right. not as it's not as simple as revolution. Right. But um, basically, they held the opinion that was you have to be prepared for armed struggle. Um, that ultimately you should be taking steps within the bounds of constitutionality. So they're prepared. They're they're ready basically to use that as leverage. Yeah. But they want to do this through the Constitution. They want to do it by the books. I feel like Papineau is just in his office and he's like, but, but 
do we all wear a fleur de lis pin or do we all wear <laughs> wear a pin that looks like this or what are we what are we wearing for footwear everybody guys we, like you know look good revolution good okay? yeah <laughs> it, it's cold out i'll go wear some mittens i really don't want to go outside and uh, that's my ultimate opinion. Can I just stay can here? Can we do this in the house? <laughs> like, in-house, guys. Come on, literally. <laughs> <laughs> he thought that by stirring up the population and boycotting tax pro- uh, products, the English government would finally be forced to give way. So he's like, let's do this through financial means. Like, let's hit them where it hurts. Again, inside. <laughs> in, like, yeah, let's hit their pockets. Like, this is what matters more. Yeah. Um, under Papineau's direction, the Comité Central et Permanent du District Montréal organized on the 15th of May, 1837, and it was to coordinate the action of the patriots throughout the entire province. So now he's trying to, like, rein them in, basically. Mm-hmm. If, however, these methods proved ineffective, he would then agree to the use of force. In this right. contingency, the armed revolt did not take place until December, after the freezing up. So... His idea is, like, if we're going to do this armed, you can't do it when the St. Lawrence is open because then the British just send ships down the river. Right. Our best hope is to wait until the river is frozen and then they can't send reinforcements. Right. Which is smart. Smart. (laughs) Once the series of great assemblies in the six counties got underway, Papineau quickly lost control of a number of the revolutionary leaders who openly preached revolt. (laughs) (laughs) This was how the Association des Filles de la Liberté came into being. Divided into two sections, civil and military, it reproduced the double intention of the planned resistance advocated by Papineau. This surge of agitation reached its highest point at the time of the Great Assembly of St. Charles, which on the 23rd of October, 1837, issued a Declaration of the Rights of Man. Papineau addressed a rally of 4,000, and the Patriots more or less declared the independence of the six counties and their willingness to resort to arms if necessary. As for Papineau, he still urged for more peaceful means. He led the committee that organized the boycott of essentially all British imports into Lower Canada. On November 15th, he created the Conseil des Patriots with Edmund Bailey O'Callaghan, he and O'Callaghan fled Montreal for St. Denis sur Richelieu on the 16th of November after Governor Gosford ordered their arrest and that of 25 other Patriot leaders. Papineau and O'Callaghan went to the home of Alfred Nelson and then they crossed into the United States on November 25th. Once in the United States, Papineau traveled under an assumed name and he is officially in exile from oh. Quebec. So basically, they're like, we're going to take up arms, or at least parts of the Patriots are going to take up arms. And so that just puts a red flag on all their heads, and they're all ordered to be arrested. Yeah. And so he's got to leave. He's like, Which he out. probably really didn't want to do. Oh, he definitely doesn't <laughs> want to leave. He's just like, I, got, I, I can't just go with my books in the country. <laughs> I should have done what I was like. It's like, I'm too old for this shit. Like, he's just yeah. like, I should have just stayed with my books. <laughs> yeah. From the spring of 1838 on, the refugees' hostility towards Papineau increased. So there's a lot of resentment for Papineau amongst the... Because they, I think they feel like, if we had just stuck together, we could have done this. Right. But you insisted on doing this through peaceful means. Which I'm sure he feels the same way. He's yeah. like, if we had just stuck together and done the boycott, like I said, we yeah. would have had our freaking independence by now. Yeah. Whatever. Not only did they reproach him with having abandoned the cause, but they attributed to him more and more the responsibility for the failure of 1837. Several went so far as to talk about his flight from St. Denis. So they're like, you left us. Like, you you, you ran bailed. away. It's like, but they were going to arrest me. Yeah. <laughs> I had to. <laughs> But several refugees tried to stop an action that would harm the movement because of Papineau's extraordinary popularity among the people. Okay. So even though the party doesn't like him, he's yeah. still very popular amongst the, the, the popular basis. Okay. After the failure of a second insurrection, the refugees convinced that Papineau's presence in the United States was the basic obstacle to any revolutionary plan, worked out a plot to get him away to France. Papineau was to win French sympathy for Lower Canada and the Lower Canadian cause, um, and on the 8th of February, 1839, he sailed from New York to Paris. Whoa. So they're just like, please leave and basically be a puppet for us and okay. be like, 
promote Lower Canada while you're in Paris. Okay. Peace, Papineau. We're going to try and revolt over here. (laughs) Peace out. Peace out. His stay in France, where his wife and three of his children eventually went to join him, produced no political results. Until 1845, Papineau lived there, poor and most often alone, but following Canadian events with great interest. So also the party's not, like, sending him money or anything. They're just like, please leave. (laughs) So he's just kind of like this (laughs) poor person. And especially in France, he's not considered elite in any way. Like, the upper crust in Quebec is at most probably considered middle class back in France. So he's just this dude... (laughs) With his family. <laughs> with his, like, wife and kids. And I don't think they stay with him the whole time. They're, yeah. they're only there part of the time. Right. He sometimes worked at the Bibliothèque Nationale, or the archives, where he copied and had copied documents relating to the French period. So, you know, he's studying. Yeah. <laughs> he had contacts with liberals, socialists, and even Irish nationalists. And he visited Italy okay. and Switzerland <laughs> while he was there. <laughs> The IRA. Yeah, the IRA. <laughs> Dipping in there. Yeah, it's the Finians. Oh, Back my God. Back to the God. Finians. <laughs> it was not until 1845, two years after his wife had returned to Canada, uh, and because of her insistence that he was finally able to end his exile, and he obtained full amnesty a year earlier, and he returns to oh, Canada. Oh, well, thank God. So now he's back. It was also because of pressure exerted by his wife and by a certain number of his friends that he turned towards politics again in 1848. God, why don't they just let him (laughs) stop? (laughs) So I believe at this point, a responsible government has been achieved and they've merged the two. So like his goals have been achieved, right? but it's achieved under the asterisks that uh, lower and upper Canada are merged. So now you have, like, a split house between English and French-speaking right. people. And French didn't want that. It's not his dream. It's not his, it's not his vision. It's not his ideal. <laughs> but I'm willing to compromise. Yeah. Like a true millennial. <laughs> In 1848, he was elected uh, as a member of the new United Legislative Assembly of the Province of Canada in the riding of St. Maurice. In severe disagreement with the emerging French-Canadian Liberal Party, he became an independent member of Parliament. A convinced Republican, after a long exile in the United States and France, two very Republican countries, Mm -hmm. uh, Papineau supported the Montreal Annexation Manifesto that called for Canada to join the United States of America. So he's also like, but what if we went to the States? And everybody's like, but no. They're like, ah, that's a lot. (laughs) It's like, but the Republican. (laughs) And we could be Republican if we (laughs) would. (laughs) Papineau refused to accept the union of the Canadas, which he regarded as a disgrace. Though his nationalism remained as uncompromising as before, he proclaimed more loudly than ever the strength of his democratic beliefs. It is true that the notion of annexation to the United States occasionally led him to question himself. Basically, like, do I value republicanism more than French-Canadian independence? He's like, because if we went in the United States, we would have even less of a cultural standing. But he's like, I'm so Republican that I just want to be part of the U.S. Right. Also, I think it makes him a little different. Yeah. <laughs> I think he like likes being he just does. a bit of like, but what if we just fucking left? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> what if we really just stirred the pot? I don't want a rebellion. I don't want to shoot anything. <laughs> but what if? <laughs> Let's be bad. <laughs> as long as I can stay inside. Yeah, as long as I don't have to go anywhere and do it myself. <laughs> <laughs> Let's be bad. <laughs> Let's be bad. <laughs> But these momentary uh, doubts that he had over his beliefs uh, would soon just be totally erased by his unabound admiration for America. Mm -hmm. He loves America. And he also has an extreme (laughs) hatred for Britain. He's he's like, and no one hated Britain more than the U.S. (laughs) Yeah. (laughs) Let's do it like they did it. Politically, he changed little. He continued to denounce responsible government as a hoax. And not that he doesn't agree with the philosophy, okay. but he's like, they gave us responsible government, but we're still part of the British Empire. Right. He's like, this isn't real. Um, so he's far more in favor of confederation, and he believes that's the only way that we'll ever truly be separate from English monarchy and okay. aristocratic institutions in Canada. Okay. The movement that produced the Institut Canadien, of which he was an honorary member, seemed to him more promising but it did not satisfy him fully so this is basically like an intellectual institution okay it's also i believe it's the institute that uh supports 
Cosmic Time by Sir Sanford Fleming. I would have oh. to go back and check that. But I think it's the same society. Oh. <laughs> he, okay. <laughs> okay. <laughs> From 1850 until his death in 1871, Papineau, without succeeding in solving his the contradictions of his beliefs, remained the prophet of annexation and democracy. Mm-hmm. To the great indignation of the priest of the parish, the seigneur of Montebello refused to return to his faith before he died, and he died loyal to his convictions till the end. So, unlike his dad, he doesn't go back to Catholicism. Unlike his dad. (laughs) But that's... that's He he did not get forgiven. (laughs) He was not forgiven. He's just like, I'll burn in hell before (laughs) I forgive you. Peace (laughs) out. Peace. (laughs) <laughs> and that's Louis Papineau. <laughs> that's it for the Paps? That's it. Oh. I like him. He's got some spunk. He's got. A, he's just kind of like, I don't know. I feel like at times I would just like roll my eyes and be like, oh my God. But at other times I'm like, yeah, you're It's also you're cool. interesting. Like he's one of those like, I don't know. Does he deserve a heritage minute? I, I don't know. I don't know, but definitely I wouldn't say the most interesting thing about his political career or him in general is the fact that he gave Jewish people the right to, like, the right to vote. Yeah, like, I I guess that, if that's going to be the heritage minute, I think it should not be called Hart and Papado. It should be called Jewish people receiving, like, because that's what it's about. Yeah. And they just choose to, like, tell that story through him. Yeah. Similarly, I think this should be a heritage minute. Like, I think this yeah. is an important story. And it's easy to tell it through the life of Papineau. Yeah. But again, should Papineau be the star of the heritage minute or should it be the event? Right. Um, but I feel like that's a shift that heritage minutes have taken. Where yeah, they I used to be agree. about people mm. and using them as avenues to talk about something. Whereas now, if you look at them, they're about the Acadian deportation. They're yeah. about the liberation of Holland. Yeah. Things that are less in some ways controversial because you can always like research a Nellie McClung and be like, Whoa, yeah. this is fucking crazy. Even yeah. though obviously what she did for the, the vote for women is very important. Yeah. Um, <laughs> oh, Nellie, <laughs> oh, Nelly. <laughs> you know, you just, you know, you never know who's out there being like, yeah, eugenics. Yeah. Super that's cool. cool. <laughs> you never know. <laughs> uh, but similarly, like, I don't know if, I mean, he's not like, a racist. No. I mean, he's probably just as racist as all the other white people, but he's like, what if poor people could vote? That'd be cool. That'd be cool. What if we could decide? What if we had like self-determinism? That'd be cool. I like that. Yeah. I love that for me. I love that for us, for all (laughs) of us. And I do appreciate his unwaveringness in his like moderation. Yeah. I I think centrists are very uh, harped on. These yeah, days as being kind of do nothings. Yeah. Which, whatever. But like in this period, I think the moderation is like not killing people. Yeah. He's just like, I'm taking real political action and like yeah. using my wits to know that what they really care about is money. That's the truth. That's that's what they actually care about. Yeah. So if we can attack that by boycotting their imports, then we we'll have a better audience. We'll have like people listening to us. Yeah. I think that's really smart. And I think that's cool. And I think it's a sin that like the party that he founds is like, yeah. Ultimately they're like, you don't give a shit about us. Yeah. Yeah. I like Papineau. He's cool. He's cool guy. Yeah. Well, thanks everyone for joining in for another episode of the Minute Women podcast. We have been doing this for almost a year, which is wild. It's bonkers. It's crazy. So thank you for following along. And uh, for those of you who weren't here at the beginning, thank you for joining in. Uh, If you're not already following us, again, I don't know what you're doing with your life. Uh, There's so much fun, interesting content on our Instagram, Facebook, (laughs) and Twitter. Uh, on Instagram and Facebook, we are at Minute Women Podcast. And on Twitter, we are at The Minute Women. We also have a website, which includes all of the episodes and artwork and the sources that Grace uses uh, for each episode. So go give that a little look-see. And that's at MinuteWomenPodcast.ca. And make sure you are subscribed to the podcast on whatever platform you listen to us on. We're on all major platforms. Make sure that you are downloading the episodes, sharing them with your friends. And if you can review and rate the podcast, if that's an option on your platform, make sure you do it. 
the internet loves the Apple podcast algorithm of rating and reviewing. So make sure you leave us five stars. Let us know what you like and even what you don't like. Yeah. You know, we might change, but, you know, we don't change for anybody. Yeah. So also, you know, just be aware of that. Yep. Sorry. (laughs) Sorry. Sorry. (laughs) Bye. Bye. Thank you.